Did you hear it? I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. And then Paul said that we are justified by grace. Now They are now justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And then Jesus said, So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Did you hear it? When I read those lines and I started thinking about this, of course my mind went to Star Wars. <laughs> to Admiral Akbar. It's a trap. It's a trap. It can't be that easy. It can't possibly be that easy that God's just going to forget everything that I've done, that I'm justified because Jesus did what he did, and that I'm free because Jesus said so. It can't be that easy. But it's not a trap. Because it is simply that easy. And yet, so stinking difficult. How many of you, and I want a show of hands, this is the one time, you don't even know the question yet, Karen. <laughs> this is the one time this month. <laughs> had to caveat that there, that I'm going to ask you to give me a show of hands. Normally I'll ask a question and I don't want to know. I don't want to see it. But I want our confirmants to see. How many of you have ever doubted or questioned your faith? And if you don't raise your hand, I remind you that you're in church. <laughs> Faith is not something that we take and we have and it's something that we always hold on to and something that, that is so big and so bright and so beautiful that it just makes our lives a living, joyful thing that we walk through singing and skipping and it's like a rose garden, right? We have trials. We have troubles. I have a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, who just now, this morning, is having a confirmation service at his congregation. They're confirming 16 people this morning, which is a wonderful number. It's a beautiful understanding of, of God's grace working in and through that church. This pastor has also done 14 funerals in the past two months. Another one of his parishioners died last night. One of his parishioners' companies caught on fire and completely was destroyed. He and I had a conversation at the end of last week about how sometimes we just want to give up and stop following God. Because sometimes it would be so much easier to just forget about all this faith stuff and just walk away from it. And just go about our lives and do the things that we want to, and the things that we think we want to do, and the things that we think we need to do, and to live our lives our own way. And as we continued our discussion, we talked about how it would be so much easier to do that, but yet, then there is no light. And there is no hope. Because Psalm 46 tells us that God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help. That He is going to be with us. See, that's what faith is. Faith is that spark. That single match strike. That single glint of light in the darkest tunnels. It's not about having full and perfect faith because there's only ever one person, and I could actually argue whether or not that one person had full and perfect faith. Because remember the night before he went to the cross in the garden, how many times did he ask, is this really what we have to do? Is this really what has to happen? Because you see, this morning we're reminded that it's truly all about freedom. So I told the kids up here, Martin Luther in 1517 nailed the thesis to the church door in Wittenberg, and I'm sure that Doug is happy that I used tape and not nails. <laughs> right? 
Because he wanted to have a discussion about the way that the church was going and the things that were happening. Because it wasn't about freedom. It was about doing things the way that the church said that they had to be done in order to make it. It was about doing things the right way and jumping through the right hoops. Confirmation students in 7th and 8th grade don't think you're going to get out of doing things the way that you have to do them. You still have to do class. You still have to jump through the hoops. But you're still free. to do what you have to do. But Martin Luther did that to have a discussion to talk about it because it's about freedom. Jeremiah tells us that. Paul tells us that in Romans. John tells us that in the Gospel, that we're free. We're free. Do you believe it? Robert Capon wrote a book, Between Noon and Three, And I have a very long quote here, so forgive me, but you need to hear this. If we, and it's from multiple pages, if we are ever to enter fully into the glorious liberty of the sons of God, we are going to have to spend more time thinking about freedom than we do. The church, by and large, has a poor record of encouraging freedom. She has spent so much time in calculating, inculcating a sphere of making mistakes, that she has made us like ill-taught piano students. We play our songs, but we never really hear them because our main concern is not to make music, but to avoid some flub that will get us in a Dutch. She has been so afraid we will lose sight of the laws of our nature that she, cared, that she made us care more about how we look than about who we are, made us act more like the subjects of a police state than fellow citizens of the saints. The law of retribution reigns supreme in our fantasies precisely to keep us off the main question of our lives. What would you do with freedom if you had it? St. Paul had not said to you, think how it would be if there were no condemnation. Think how it would be if there were no condemnation. That's not what Paul said. Paul said, there is therefore now none. He made an unconditional, not a conditional statement, a flat assertion, not a parabolic one. He has not said, God has done this and that and the other thing, and if by the dint of imagination you can manage to get it, get it all together, you may be able to experience a little solace in the prison of your days. No, he simply said, you are free. Your services are no longer required. The salt mine has been closed. It is essential that you see this clearly. The Apostle is saying that you, Paul, and I have been sprung right now. Not next week, not at the end of the world, or at the world that is to come. And unconditionally. There is no probation officer to report to. But that means that we have finally come face to face with the one question we have always thought we were aching to hear, but now we realize we have scrupulously ducked every time it gets within a mile of us. It was a question that he raised in the very first chapter of the book and has been lurking here all along. What would you do with freedom if you had it? Now it is posed to you not as a subjunctive, but in the indicative. You are free. What do you plan to do? You are free. What do you plan to do? I hope not what Sarah told me a joke Friday night after the banquet about the mice. There was a church where they found mice in the church. The secretary, I'm going to tell it wrong, I'm sure, but it's okay. I'll get to the point of it. But the secretary found some mice in the church, came to the pastor and said, Pastor, we found these mice in the church. What are we going to do? So the pastor confirmed them. <laughs> See, I don't even have to finish it, right? You're free. So what are you going to do with it? And it's, Mar- and it's Reformation Sunday, so I have to quote Martin Luther. Martin Luther wrote in a letter to Philip Melanchthon following the Diet of Worms. If you don't know what the Diet of Worms is, it's not eating a bowl of worms out of a... Ask a confirmation student, and if they don't know, make them look it up. But Martin Luther wrote to Philip Melanchthon, If you are a preacher of grace, then preach a true, not a fictitious grace. If grace is true, you must bear a true... Bear a true and not a fictitious sin. God does not save people who are only fictitious sinners. 
Be a sinner and sin boldly, but believe and rejoice but believe and rejoice in Christ even more boldly. For he is victorious over sin, death, and the world. And as long as we are here, we have to sin. This life is not the dwelling place of the righteous. But as Peter says, we look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Pray boldly, for you too are a mighty sinner. It's not possible to go through life without making mistakes. It's not possible to go through life without questioning your faith. But what Luther is saying to Melanchthon here is that, you know what, you're going to make mistakes. So do it. I bet if you asked every teacher in here, they'd be happy with a student that makes 20 mistakes and finally figures something out than a student that gets it right and doesn't know what the heck is going on. Teachers? Be bold in your life. Be bold in your proclamation. Be bold in your faith and live it out loud. Because we have been given a faith and a life that no one else has as a gift. And you're free. To paraphrase Luther's statement to Melanchthon, which is often misquoted, but in a crude way, get off your butt and do something, even if it's wrong. Because God will forgive you. We can't let fear of failure to keep us from making mistakes or living our lives. We can't let fear of not having faith keep us from living our lives. If we follow through what Luther is saying here and understand sin is our self-centeredness, that's what shows us what our freedom actually is. Right? It's not about ourselves. We can't be centered on ourselves doing things only for ourselves. And that's often how we think of freedom, right? I'm free to do whatever I want to. So I'm going to do whatever I want to do. But the freedom that God calls us to, the freedom that Jesus says talks about here, where God's going to remember our sins no more, and God saves us and set us free in the household to be members of God's kingdom is a freedom that's not about us, but about the other. It's not doing whatever I want, but the definition of freedom is actually slavery to one's own self. It's where we deny ourselves and take up the, the need of the other. Being set free means having our desires and our centeredness turns away from ourselves. Giving is more important than getting. And the extreme of this is dying for the other is more important than preserving one's own life like Christ did for each and every one of you. It's giving up our own lives. It's a free response. Not because we get something. Even if that's a good feeling but we give because that's what God called us to do and freed us to do. So this morning, as these eight young people come forward and I make them answer questions, (laughs) they've been set free by God who set each and every one of us free. And this morning, they're affirming that journey that all of us are on, that all of us are taking. A journey that has our faith going from not believing at times to having a full understanding of who God is and all the where in between. And living out our lives in such a way that that light is a shining hope out there in the darkness, even when we can't possibly find our way. Knowing that we don't go it alone because we go it with everybody. All of you are here because of the love you have for these kids. Whether you knew that or not, you thought you were just coming to worship this morning because it was Sunday morning. No, it's because you're here because of these young people who are coming here this morning. Because they are a part of this family. They are a part of the body of Christ, and all of us bear that witness to them and to all the world. So be freed in your life, not to serve yourself, but to serve others. And for those of you being confirmed, Know that God loves you and cares about you deeply and is walking with you through this life of faith. And know that you never go it alone, even if you think you do. God and this body is always with you.